house is mine. Amen. Thank you, Lord. All right, if you'll please take the word of God. We want to go to the New Testament to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, we'll begin reading in verse 11. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. If you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, in verse 11, there's a phrase that will just jump off the page at you, and it says this, O man of God. O man of God. We'll talk about that phrase in just a second. O man of God. Father, help us tonight as we look in your word. There's some, some wise counsel that you give us here. And Lord, we need your help. We need your help for these things to be evident in our life. As we live for you, we want this to be true. And I pray that you would do this. I pray that we would see the need, that you would identify in our hearts and lives what we need tonight. May we leave here with a renewed vision of what you want for us, what you tell us right here in the scriptures, and may we find you to be faithful as we allow you to work in our lives, that you're going to be thorough with us, and you'll help us tonight. Lord, there might be one here that's not saved tonight. Lord, I pray that you would speak very definitely to that person in their heart, and that they would respond definitely to you, and yield to you, and come to you without any reserves. Nothing attached to the death, burial, and resurrection of your son to pay for their sins. Just believing it and receiving your son tonight. What a glorious day that'd be for someone if they would do that. And we'd rejoice in it. But we'd also rejoice, as we've already asked, that you change our lives today, tonight by your Holy Spirit and as we yield to you. May you give us the liberty by your Holy Spirit to respond the way we ought to. Give me liberty to preach. And we'll thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. O man of God. Now Paul was writing this Holy Spirit inspired letter to Timothy. Obviously giving him some instruction. We understand Paul taught Timothy a whole bunch of things about the ministry because he was his son in the faith. And he walked, they walked together. And uh, he was instructing him in this ministry. But even outside of ministry in uh, living the Christian life. Because it, it really should never be separated. Um, before I was ever a pastor, I was just a believer. Just living what God wanted me to live. And then God led me and led me and I'm here. So it doesn't make me any different that I'm a pastor than I was 20 years ago. I still needed the same thing. I still needed to live for the Lord. I still needed to let the Lord help me to live for Him. And we come to this phrase here, O man of God, and and I understand that when you say that, people would be referring to someone like myself. Um, they would say, oh, that's a, the man of God. Okay, I understand that. Um, you know, it's, it's something that has been said. But I don't think that this is, is only referring to somebody that's in the Lord's work full time. I don't think, I mean, obviously Paul was talking to Timothy here, being the man of God. Um, but I think it's any man or woman that's a representative of the Lord. Any person of God, um, obviously he was a man, and hey, and there's no question, if you're a man, you know you're a man, and if you're a woman, you know you're a woman, okay, amen? All right, and uh, Paul, somehow, he knew Timothy was a man. I don't know, I'm not sure how he knew that, but he knew Timothy was a man. I mean, we were messed up, aren't we? We were messed up. Um, anyway, I wish Paul lived today. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, the same Holy Spirit that directed him directs us, and uh, it's not very hard to understand. He's a man of God. But, you know, we're all representatives of the Lord. Every believer represents the Lord. 
Hey, it can be in a good way and it can be in a bad way. But we all represent the Lord, so we're a man or woman of God. I mean, we should all be able to say, hey, sometimes when you just live the Christian life, people call you certain things. Like, sometimes, you know, Gary will go places and he texts me the other day and he said, well, where I was at, I don't know where he was at, but he was out doing something. But he's just being faithful, telling people about the Lord. And he said, they called me preacher man. Well, he's not a preacher. He's not a pastor. He's just a man of God. He just knows God. He's representing God, right? And same as we go places and we know God, we're representing God. And, uh, and so we do. The Bible actually tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, it says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So there, he was saying they were, we're ambassadors. Paul was. Those believers in Corinth were. They were ambassadors for Christ. They represented Christ. And so... We can say, as we go and we represent Christ, that we're a man of God or we're a woman of God. I'm not a woman of God. We're not going to get confused about that, are we? I'm not a woman of God. I'm a man of God. And if you're a woman here in this building, you're a woman of God. All right? How did I get hung up on this thing about a woman of God and a man of God tonight? Anyway, Timothy was challenged here in this passage. And I want to see what Paul was challenging him for uh, and what he was needing to do, not just as the man of God as the pastor, but as a Christian, as a believer. Here, well, let's look in verse 11. And the Bible says, but thou, O man of God. And then it says this, flee these things. So first of all, he has a challenge here to flee. There are some things that we ought to flee in our life. We don't always flee what we ought to flee, but there are some things we ought to get away from and run from. To flee means to shun it or escape by running away from something. In this case, it's evil that the Bible is speaking of that we ought to flee and get away from. And it says this, flee these things. Now, let me help you. When you see a a phrase like that in the Bible, you say, what things? That's a good question. Now, what do you ask? What things? And then that means you have to look back to see what things that Paul was just talking about because he said, flee these things. So he was just talking about them in this letter. And see, it's not too complicated, is it? So let's go back to verse 3 and following and see what he's fleeing from and what he's telling him. In verse 3 it says this, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine which is according to godliness. By the way, doctrine is important. It looks like that what the Bible says right there. If it's not the doctrine of Christ and it's not doctrine of godliness, you ought to be aware of it. You ought to be thinking something about that. And uh, it says, look, if this person's not, if he's going to teach otherwise than this, he's not going to hold to what godliness and what Christ was saying, the words of Christ. It says this in verse 4, He is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strifes of words, Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. That's a bad list of things. But you know, there's people that live this way. There's people that are on TV preaching what they call the gospel. And they think, they suppose, that gain is godliness. If you have wealth, then you're right with God. Well, Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. I don't think, right? And uh, Paul didn't have very much. So that can't be the truth. Now, will God give us what we need? I, I believe God is going to give us what we got. I believe that's what the Bible teaches. I believe He's faithful to us. He's going to provide for us. But when you have people teaching that, withdraw thyself from them. Don't give them money. <laughs> Don't send money to their ministry on TV because you're going to get a hundredfold back. They're supposing that gain is godliness. 
And they've got to be really godly because they're making millions of dollars off you or whoever gives to them, right? Every year, these people. Now, we call these people false teachers. <laughs> so he's telling him, previously already told him, flee from false teachers, Timothy. There's going to be people who are false teachers. They're not going to have the right mindset about the gospel, about God, about godliness, not even the words of Jesus Christ. You flee from them. Maybe what they're saying seems to be okay, but flee from them because it's not correct. We find the same Greek word used uh, for fleeing in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now the Spirit itself, uh, Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Hey, there's that doctrines again. Doctrines important. And some people are teaching doctrines of devils, not the doctrine of God. And by the way, doctrines is always plural when it's talking about the devil. He has a lot of them. He has a lot of different teachings. But when God is talking about God's teachings, it's doctrine, singular. God has one teaching, one doctrine, and it's the doctrine of God. And so, this word that we find here, shall depart, in the verse number one, from the faith, that means they're fleeing away from the faith. They want nothing to do with the faith that's been passed down, that's been once delivered, like the Bible says in Jude, uh, to us. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible says, um, let's see here, chapter 2 verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That word depart is the same Greek word that says flee. Get away from it. That's how you know a believer and somebody who's walking with God is they get away from iniquity. They don't hang around with it. They're not flirting with it. It's flee it. Get away from these things. And one of these things here is false teachers that he tells them to get away from. Look at Galatians chapter 1 with me. Galatians chapter 1. This is just one kind of false teacher that we're going to find right here in this passage I'm talking about. Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 6 and following. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there, are, there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Meaning it's not another of the same kind of gospel. They're perverting it. That means they have changed it. It is a different gospel message. Then the Bible goes on and says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, that's pretty strong. Paul said, if I come back in three years and preach to you, Galatians, a different thing than I'm preaching to you now, let me be accursed. If an angel come down from heaven whose name is Moroni and gives you some golden glasses on some golden tablets and tells you that this is the new gospel, another testament of Jesus Christ, he's accursed. Don't believe him. Now, I just talked about Mormonism there. Don't believe it. As we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. People preaching a false gospel, you've got to flee from them. We know the gospel from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures. Nothing added to it, nothing taken away from it. When people talk about, the, if you ask somebody what the gospel is, you're going to get, if you ask 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers. Because they believe the gospel includes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, your repentance, your confession, your faith, your baptism, your good works, your church membership. Everything under the sun is included in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then you have people who want to add to that, take away from it, whatever you want to say. They got their own gospel. They perverted the gospel of Christ. And it's simple. Christ is simple. 
He's done it for us. You've got to get away from You've got to flee false teachers. Then the Bible says, as we get back over here to 1 Timothy chapter 6, he moves on into verse 6 and following. And it says this. So he just talked about they think gain is godliness. You would draw yourself from them. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Now that's the true statement. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Now that's not a dirty word. Now, if you're a materialistic person, contentment's a dirty word. Because you're not okay with what you have. You're not okay with what God's given you. So you think you need more. Hey, there's nothing wrong with getting more. But if that's all you ever do, is that's why you work to get more? So you can spend time doing that? So you can work more to get more, to do more? Then that's materialism. That's materialism. You're not going to be content. You'll never be content uh, like that. Look, then let's move on. Verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know what he's telling them here? He's telling them not only to flee false teachers, but he's telling them to flee carnal motivations. What's motivating you? Is it just the flesh? Is it just what you can get? Is it just what you can accumulate? Is it all about you? That's carnal. He said, he said, Timothy, that's not what life's about. Uh, look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And we can make the equation here for, for these false teachers that he was just talking about because it seemed like they were carnally motivated. In John chapter 10, we have Jesus speaking here, and he's speaking about um, the sheep coming in. the door, and the, and the shepherd, and the false shepherd. And, and we get down to verse 10, and it says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd, Jesus is saying. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Amen. But, I was about to tell you the bad shepherd. But he that is an hireling, that's the false teacher, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is an hireling, and careth not for the sheep. So, what we find here is this false teacher. There's a carnal motive for why they're doing what they're doing. What's a hireling? Uh, well, a hireling is someone who gets paid to do something, and that's the only reason why they do it. It's a carnal motivation. Carnal. Well, look at Jude. Jude warns us about this as well in Jude 11. The Bible says this, Woe unto them! Wow, what a way to start, huh? Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran, listen to what it says, greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Well, Balaam did some things because he was greedy and he was getting paid to do it. He wasn't doing it because God wanted him to do it. He was doing it because he was carnally motivated. And it wasn't right. It wasn't right. Our decisions as believers should never be determined by money. Should never be determined by money. Look, let me, let me tell you, some of you might have heard this before, some of you might not have, but when I came here, when the Lord put us together, me, my family, the church, and I came over here, my wife and I already knew this was God's will before we ever stepped foot on the property, before we ever came here. Um, but when we came, of course, it was good to come because coming did not make our decision. It confirmed our decision. It just gave clarity to it, just, just gave a stamp on it. That was all we already knew. And us, but when we got here, something... Something took place while we were here. I met with some of the men of the church. 
and we sat down and we talked about things. We talked about maybe what I believed and other things, you know, situations. And, and we started talking about finances. And, um, and, you know, and they were like, well, we don't have much really to offer you. And I said, well, I said, um, I said okay. And then, you know, they were just talking because that really wasn't my first concern coming. It was not going to be my determining factor. But they told me a number that we can give you a month. And I said, okay, okay. I said, I said just wait a minute. I said, I wasn't even going to show you this piece of paper I had. <laughs> and so I said, what I've done is I've windled down everything that we need. And I said, I've come up with our own little budget and what we need to live on monthly. And I said, and the only reason I'm showing you this is because I want you to see it. So what I showed them was within $100 of what they said they could give the church. And I said, you know, that didn't make my decision. If the church couldn't have given me what I had on the sheet, it wouldn't have made my decision. But you know what it did? It confirmed it for me. Like everything fell into place like that with the Lord and what he called us to do. But I didn't make the decision based on money. You know, and, and, and as a believer, we didn't make the decision based on money. As a believer, you should never make decisions based on money. In anything. You know, you're going to lose your job. Well, don't base it on money. Base it on the will of God. What does God have for your life? Just a side note. So I know God has me here. Good thing. The challenge to flee. The challenge to flee. There's some things we ought to be fleeing. But then the Bible goes on in verse 11, and it says, uh, it says this, and follow after. Well, he said, oh man of God, I want you to flee these things I've been talking about. But then this is what I want you to follow after. I want you to run hard away from those things. But as you're running away from those things, this is what I want you to run right into. This is what I want you to do in your life. This means follow means to run swiftly in order to pursue something. In this case, it's referring, referring to running after the Lord and running after His will in Timothy's life. We find in Philippians, if you'll go back there with me, Philippians chapter 3, in verse 12, the Bible says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Running after the Lord. When he's put it behind those things that were behind him, he said, I'm moving forward. He just kept running with the Lord. This is Paul speaking to the Philippians. This is his testimony. This is him talking about his walk with God here. It is even implied in the meaning of the word that this kind of following after the Lord leads us to persecution. It says, follow after and then he goes into what he's telling them to follow after. Run swiftly to the Lord. You know, well, the Bible does tell us if we follow the Lord in 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's not a, not a, a, a crazy thought for us to have, not a misunderstanding of the Word of God, to know as we follow Him and flee from the things that He tells us to flee from, which is a lot more to flee from than just false teachers and that kind of mindset of being carnal uh, there with our motivations. But as we flee from those things and flee to Him, there's probably going to be some persecution that comes, but there's going to be a change in our life and our behavior and the way we go about doing things in our life. So, what does He tell them? First of all, we're to follow correct behavior. Correct behavior. The Bible says that He is to follow after righteousness, godliness. Those two words describe the correct behavior we ought to have. We act right when we are living the truth. That's when we're acting right. We're living out the truth in our life. We're to follow after righteousness. This has to do with our inward, inside of us, and in our inward man, our inward character that leads to outward righteousness. God's, God is righteous. He lives inside of us. It's that inward righteousness that motivates something outside of us, and that's the righteousness that we have inside of us. We're to follow after righteousness. 
We're to be following Him, and He makes us righteous, even practically walking with Him. But the Bible also says we're to follow after godliness. Uh, look at 1 Timothy 4.12. 1 Timothy 4.12 says this, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Describing godliness. Godliness. That this has to do, godliness has to do with our outward, practical holiness. Righteousness has to do with our inward. Godliness has to do with what comes out of our righteousness that's inward. It will lead us to godliness outwardly in our life. So we act right when we are living right. So as we follow, we're going to have the correct behavior, but we act right when we're believing the truth as well. The next word that we find in that, li that list is faith. We're to follow after righteousness, godliness, faith. We're believing the truth. Did you know our belief affects our behaviors? What we believe affects what we do in our life. What we really do is often how we really behave. Ouch. Ouch. So often I, that hits me because I behaved the wrong way. I said the wrong thing. I reacted the wrong way. And I'm like, something's wrong with my belief system right now. Something's wrong with me right now that I acted that way when I shouldn't have acted that way in my life. But faith, we follow faith. When we trust God, when we believe Him, it changes our behavior. It gives us correct behavior. It gives us righteousness on the inside. gives us godliness on the outside. And we just keep moving forward by faith in our life because all of that works together. And then not only that, we're to follow not only correct behavior, but caring behavior. What's the next word? Love. Love. This is what we're to follow after. It's going to be caring in our behavior. This love is the agape love of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we find in verses 4 through 8, and it's referring to the Lord's love that He has that's shed abroad in our hearts that we can show other people what they need through us. It's not our love, it's His love. Let's just go back to 1 Corinthians 13 real quick. I always like reading through these verses just so I can get convicted. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse 4. Charity, this is talking about the same love, this agape love, God's love. And it says, Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. And we'll just stop right there. Wow, what a list of the love of God. And we can have all of that if we're following after righteousness, we're following after godliness because it's flowing out of the righteousness inside of us to outside of us in godliness. We're, we're, we're having faith and the love of God shows abroad in our hearts to other people. Well, the Bible says we're to follow correct behavior and caring behavior, but we also find here in the last two words, if we can get back there in 1 Timothy, uh, it says patience, meekness. What we find here is we're to follow controlled behavior. Not only correct behavior, caring behavior, but controlled behavior. That's what these two words show us here. Patience is when we wait with a cheerful, hopeful endurance. We're just patient. We're just waiting. We're enduring whatever's coming our way, but with patience, we wait. We wait. Let's look, look at some verses here about it. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into, into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the... Uh, rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, 
That's a tough one, isn't it? We glory in tribulations. Also, knowing that tribulations worketh what? Patience. And patience, experience. And experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The Bible says we ought to have patience, that cheerful, hopeful endurance, because it brings something else into our life. As we have one thing, it brings something else and something else, and it does the work that God's doing in our life. It helps us with that. Look at chapter 8 of Romans. Romans chapter 8. I think if I had us all to bow our heads and close our eyes, we'd say we all have an issue with patience. The world has made us that way. The world has made us very impatient people, starting with that microwave way back long ago that makes you just don't want to put it in the stove. You want to put it right in the microwave. All right? And uh, chapter 8, verse 25 of Romans, the Bible says, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Hey, we're waiting for the Lord to come back. We're waiting. Patiently. Patiently. Lord, even so, come quickly. <laughs> but if you don't, we're waiting. We're trusting you. We're going to be cheerful in the meantime. We're going to endure whatever we need to endure. But we're waiting on you. Hebrews chapter 12. When we get to Hebrews chapter 12, we find that we're supposed to be running this race that we're in. By the way, you're not in a race until you get saved. But when you get saved, you're now put in a race. And uh, it's your own race. You're not racing against me, and I'm not racing against you. But we get here to Roman, uh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 12. And the Bible says here, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, all these Hebrews 11 people who are witnessing that we can have faith and trust God, and He'll deliver them and help them. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That is the Christian race. That's our Christian life. And it's patience. We just go and we wait. We go, we wait. We go, we wait. And the Bible says that's one thing we're to follow after is patience. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. There's a perfect work that patience is doing in your life and doing in my life, and usually that involves faith. Because it takes faith to just be patient. That doesn't mean you're not doing anything and just sitting there, but it means you just keep working, you just keep doing what God's will for your life, but you're waiting for God to do what He said He was going to do. Just patience. Second, Second Peter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. There's that love on the end of all that. But we're to have patience. To add to it. Add to our faith. We just keep moving with God and He keeps adding things to us and helping us in our life where we need help. Patience. That's a controlled behavior. If you're not patient, it's not God's fault. Because patience is working. We've got to let it have its perfect work in our heart and life. Wait on God. Then this Bible says meekness. Meekness is when we act with gentleness and humility. Meekness. Meekness is not just a word for women. Although I hope you know if you're a woman here tonight. And if you're a man, you can be meek. Don't confuse meekness for weakness. I think it was the Bible said of Moses that he was the meekest man. Wow, Moses, the meekest man? Because if we think that means weak, then Moses was the weakest man. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. You know what meekness means? Strength under control. Strength under control. 
You can be the strongest man in any area in your life, but you can control that. God can help you control that. You can be a meek person and you don't have to tell everybody you're as strong as you are in that area. It's just under control. Strength under control. Meekness. That's what he wants in our life. That's what he's telling Timothy. Follow after meekness. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Look what he says in verse 25. In meekness, that strength under control, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You know what the servant of the Lord wants to do when, when there's a person that's opposing themselves? That's going against what God wants for their life? You want to choke them. Spiritually, I mean in a good way, right? You want to choke them. You want to say, wake up. What are you doing? Don't you know this is wrong? Wake up. Wake up out of that. But you can't choke them. I mean, you could choke them. But you don't, you're not supposed to choke them. I don't want you to go to jail, Okay. You're not supposed to choke them. That's not right. Well, what happens is you have your strength. You know it's wrong, but the Bible says in meekness you instruct them. Not in your strength. That strength under control. You instruct them. Because maybe, maybe they'll see God at work in you, and God will grant them repentance. They'll be thankful that you spoke to them the way you did, and you were under control when you did it. Meekness. That's the challenge to follow. We challenge to flee, get away from the wrong things, follow after the right things. And then the Bible says in verse 12, let's go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. It's the challenge to fight. We're to fight our spiritual fight. Look at what verse 12 says. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. We're to fight our spiritual fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. We see here that we have a spiritual battle that we're fighting. And the Bible says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's our spiritual fight. 2 Timothy also talks about that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Right? We're in a fight. It's a good fight. It's a spiritual fight. And the Bible says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. So we, are, we see here a struggle to endeavor to accomplish something. We're fighting the good fight. By the way, we're not fighting each other. That's not the good fight. Some churches think that's the good fight. <laughs> so everybody's fighting each other. Well, that's not right. They should get some meekness, right? The strength under control. And uh, get some love of God in your heart. Um, and stop fighting each other. See, our fight's not against our employer. Not against our employees if you own your own business. Right? That's not the fight. Fight's not against your spouse. Often we think it is, right? Some people are cutting their eyes. I'm not going to look that way. Uh, but we don't. it's not against your spouse. Guess what? Fight's not even against your children. I feel like it is. But it's not against our children. It's not against children. It's not against your parents. That's not the fight. Sometimes you feel like it is, don't you? And you want to do what I said earlier. Okay, that's not the fight. It's against the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the fight. That's the fight. And our flesh is what we battle more than anything else. And our flesh, we have not put it to death. Spiritually, we have not followed the right things. So therefore, when we deal with anybody in any situation, they're the problem. It's not our flesh, and it's not their flesh. It's they're the problem. And that's where we fight. 
That's why we find ourselves fighting other people. But the fight's on our knees. The fight's before God. God can do more for someone else than you can do, talking to them face to face. Now, sometimes God will use you that way. So, hey, Paul had to confront Peter, didn't he? Got right in his face and told him he was wrong. But I think Paul probably prayed for Peter too. We ought to be praying for other people. We ought to be fighting the fight, the spiritual fight. It's a good fight. It's not other people that we're fighting. And then it's not only a spiritual fight, but we, we are to fight to a successful finish. Successful finish. You see, the Bible says you've got to lay hold on eternal life. This is telling us to seize or to fall, catch, or grasp something. And this something is eternal life. In order for it to help us. Have you ever laid hold on eternal life in, in your life? Have you ever come to grips that you have eternal life? Have you ever thought about what that means in your life? That's what Paul was talking about when he says, I press toward the mark. He said, I haven't, I haven't figured out everything that the reason why God saved me. I haven't, can't apprehend that. I can't comprehend it. But I'm going to keep trying. Keep laying hold of the eternal life. This is not in reference to Paul telling Timothy, well, now, Timothy, you need to lay hold on eternal life. You need to work, you need to work for your salvation. That's not what he's telling Timothy. That's ridiculous to think he's telling him to lay hold on eternal life because he might not be having eternal life. No, no. He's talking to him as if he's someone who has eternal life. But he's telling him to catch or grasp eternal life. It's not just something that you got at a moment in time. It's something that you live out in your life. You, 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 not, you not only take hold on it, but when you lay hold on eternal life, it lays hold on you. Has eternal life laid hold on you? I mean, he said, Timothy, you need to keep moving forward in this because when you fight the good fight of faith, you're going to have to lay hold on eternal life because it's got to lay hold on you and it's got to get a hold of you in your life. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. The Bible says here, Charge them that are rich in this world <clears throat> that they be not high-minded nor trust in the uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth richly all things to enjoy. That's our God. <laughs> that they do good. So he's telling them, tell them this, to, tell them to do good. That they be rich in good works. Saying, it's not so much the riches of this world that they need to be rich in, it's the riches of good works that they need to have. Ready to distribute, willing to communicate, meaning willing to give other people of their riches. Then in verse 19 it says, Laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Same phrase. They lay hold on eternal life. We're to be rich in good works and laying them up in store for eternity. Listen, if we lay hold on eternal life and eternal life lays hold on us, God has all of our riches. We're going to be content in Him. We're not going to need all the riches. What we're going to be concerned about is are we rich in good works? Because if eternal life lays hold on you, you're going to say, I'm not doing enough for God. That's the mindset of somebody who's laid hold of an eternal life. I'm not doing enough. But you'll find out you can never do enough. You just have to keep fighting the good fight. Lay hold on eternal life. Let eternal life lay hold on you. We should desire to finish strong by fleeing evil and following the Lord every day because we have a fight to fight. And I'm thankful we have this challenge here and that the Lord has instructed us, but He's not only instructed us, but guess what else He's done? He's equipped us to do it. You can flee, I can flee. You can follow, I can follow. You can fight, I can fight. And it's all because of the Lord. It really has nothing to do with your talents, my talents. It has everything to do with Christ. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. And I'm thankful that we're all representatives as your children of you. Sometimes we're very poor representatives. And sometimes we're better because we've trusted you by faith. And 
and we've allowed you to control us in our thoughts and our actions and our reactions. And we look more righteous and godly than we did when we weren't following you. Our faith is strong and, and Lord, we have your love and we have patience in our life and meekness. Lord, that's, that's, that's beautiful to people when they see that in our life. And it's only going to work more and more as we fight the good fight. As we lay hold on eternal life and what you've given us, when that really becomes our mindset of what we've got, Lord, you are going to change us. You're going to cause our feet to run as far as we can from the things you tell us to flee from. Oh, Lord, we want that. We want that in our heart and life. Want to be all that you saved us to be. Would you help us tonight to respond to you accordingly? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I can't be called a man of God because I'm not a representative of God because I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. I've never been reconciled to Jesus Christ. I'm still in my sins, and if I die in my sins, I'm going to die and go to hell. You said, I'm honest with God tonight, and I know that. Would you raise your hand? That's me. I need help tonight. There's no more. Tonight I want to lay hold on eternal life by actually getting it. And then I want to walk with God and I want to lay hold on eternal life for it to lay hold on me. Who says that tonight? I'm, I'm lost and I need Jesus tonight. Do you want to talk to somebody? Brother Steve? We've been talking with her. So just go over again with her. Believers, what kind of representative are you for the Lord? Are you fleeing evil? Specifically tonight, false teachers? Don't let them have a place in your life. They're going to mess you up. They're going to confuse you. Not carnal motivations. Don't let your life be dictated by carnality, by your flesh, but by the Lord. Are you following the Lord with the correct, caring, controlled behavior that He wants for you to have? Are you fighting to the finish? We're in the spiritual battle, but it can result, it can finish in success. It will, if you're in Christ. But why don't you have some success along the way in victory right now in the spiritual battle that we're fighting? Man of God, woman of God, take these things. Make them your own. Lay hold on them tonight. It's from the Word of God, Scripture. Father, please help us. Please guide us in our thoughts and our hearts tonight with these things. Help us to meditate upon these here this week and um, be better for it. We'll see what you're doing. We'll acknowledge it. We'll hopefully be humbled, and you'll, you'll deliver us from ourselves. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Till we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make Him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless. Don't forget about the uh, basket up here if anybody had something. And if you don't have it available with you tonight,